Hello, everyone. I'm David Canadine, president of the British Academy. And as you'll just have seen from the uh, video, uh, we are the National Academy in the United Kingdom for the humanities and the social sciences in the way that the Royal Society in the United Kingdom is the National Academy for the sciences themselves. Uh, next year, we shall celebrate our 120th birthday. Uh, we are a fellowship of a thousand scholars across the range of humanities and social sciences, most distinguished in their field, and of 300 corresponding fellows uh, based overseas. Among my predecessors as president are the philosophers Honor Reneal and Isaiah Berlin, historians Owen Chadwick and H.L. Fisher, economists Nick Stern and Lionel Robbins. And among uh, many very brilliant fellows who are currently uh, associated with the Academy are Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and Mary Beard, uh, the classical historian. We try to understand the way the world works and the way the world works now. We invest in researchers and projects across the United Kingdom and overseas, uh, engaging the public with fresh thinking and debates and bringing together scholars, government, business and civil society to influence policy for the benefit of everyone. Two of our major projects at the moment are the future of the corporation, looking at how businesses need to better regulate themselves and to have a greater sense of public responsibility uh, beyond just making money, and a report commissioned by the government on the economic and social consequences of COVID, which we shall be publishing next month. One of my most agreeable jobs as president of the Academy is that I have the honor of awarding the President's Medal each year, which recognizes outstanding service to the cause of the humanities and the social sciences. Previous recipients of the medal include the writer and historian Willie Dalrymple, primatologist Dame Jane Goodall, internet entrepreneur Jimmy Wales, and the author Dame Hilary Mantel. And it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome the winner of the 2020 President's Medal to our virtual stage today, Margaret Atwood. I can't believe for one moment that she needs any introduction. She is the author of over 50 works of fiction, poetry, critical essays and graphic novels. Her work has been widely translated and published in more than 45 countries. And among many accolades, she has twice won the Booker Prize. She is also notable as a public voice on many of society's greatest challenges, particularly the environment and climate change. She has been awarded the British Academy President's Medal for the year 2020 for her outstanding contributions to literature. And to prove that this award has actually happened, she is indeed in possession of this medal, which arrived by mail only two or three days ago. Uh, uh, I'm thrilled to be speaking to Margaret today, but before we actually get started, Margaret, would you like to show this medal just so the audience can indeed be convinced that you have actually received it? Here it is. First of all, we have uh, this side of it, which says what it is. And on the other side, we have the Muse of History called Cleo. Uh, holding a scroll that says, what does it say? Uh, Cleo asked questions or something like that. And beside her, there's something that looks like a pot full of mushrooms, but it is not mushrooms. It's a pot full of scrolls. And those little round things are the tops of the scrolls. So, so documents. She's got a pot of documents, historical documents. That should be very, very exciting to you. <laughs> well, it's fair to say that Cleo, of course, did invent the very idea of inquiry, which if one wanted to sum up uh, in many ways what the British Academy does, and perhaps if one wanted to try to sum up one of the major themes, Margaret, of your own work, inquiry would perhaps be a very good one. Just some housekeeping points before we get to the serious business. Uh, Margaret and I are going to talk about various aspects of her work for something between half an hour and 40 minutes, and be assured you will be hearing much more from Margaret than you will from me. 
me, which is the whole point of this gathering. Uh, and at the point when, as it were, we may, uh, though I think this unlikely, have run out of things to say between us, I shall then invite broader questions from the audience. They will, as it were, be curated and sent to me in the chat column, and I will then put them uh, to Margaret. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, probably more than we can actually get through, but we are very eager that this should be a more interactive gathering than just Margaret and myself talking. So, Margaret, uh, welcome. It's a huge pleasure to greet you. I'm sorry it has to be virtual, but at least that means we have a bigger global audience than we otherwise might, and that's exceptionally good news. Can I start being a historian? One always wants to start at the beginning and end at the end. Um, let me start with, as it were, your early years. You spent much of your time growing up and living in rather remote parts of Canada, uh, partly because your father was an entomologist. And it was also during this time, I think, that you first began to write. So I suppose I'm interested to ask, given your later uh, commitment to environmental causes, how did this early life, uh, which was about the environment and soon became about writing, how did, as it were, all that happen? What did it mean to you and what's been its continued presence in your life ever since? Well, uh, yeah, so we're looking at, at Canada, which is very big. And uh, we are looking at the boreal forest, and my father was a uh, field entomologist, which meant that he was doing research for uh, spring, summer, and fall, and then going to a city to write up the results in winter where when insects do nothing. So they do things in all of those other seasons. So I think the most important thing was you learned amongst the biologists uh, not to generalize too much, and uh, it, growing up amongst the scientists, you learn to test hypotheses. Um, so you learn you learn the difference between what is verifiable and what is not verifiable. But of course, all this time we were doing what the kids do. My older brother uh, did turn into a biologist. I did not, uh, but might have. Uh, but we were also doing a lot of invention. Reading, writing, and and um, drawing were the only things you could do there when it was raining because we had no electricity, we had no running water, we had no uh, connection with the usual kinds of things that kids might have available to them in towns and, and cities. So uh, it was entertain yourself. And he was a prolific author, much more so than I. So I think my first books were probably, or book lads, my first written works uh, were imitations of, of him to a certain extent, but I also at that time wrote a play, not well received, bad reviews, um, and um, I compiled a collection of poetry at that same time. So for, I think all kids do this, or they do some very similar things. Uh, they're certainly intensive uh, narrators. And writers are just people who carry on once they've grown up. How far, <clears throat> you've written quite a lot about notions of Canadian identity. How far do you think that the, the, the huge rural spaces in Canada uh, informed your own sense of Canadian identity and perhaps inform more broadly a Canadian sense of such shared identity as they may perhaps have? Yes, well, I started thinking about this at a, at a time when we were supposed not to have one, and that would have been approximately 1960. And in 63, I worked for a market research company, and we did, as part of our research, a very curious question, set of questions. One of them was, is there any difference between Canada and the United States? And most people said no, because they didn't know what it was. And the second question was, do you think Canada should join the United States? And most people said no. What did that tell you? It told you that they didn't know what the difference was, but they knew there was one. Because people weren't writing about this much at all, and we were constantly told we didn't really have a literature, we didn't really have a history of any interest, we didn't have any identity. Um, so that's why we started thinking about that in the 60s. And um, that's what, one of the reasons we started small publishing companies and um, magazines at that time. Um, so things have changed quite a lot since then, and so has the notion of identity, and so has the notion of what is a nation, and uh, all of these things have um, have 
uh, changed considerably. And, uh, so has the notion of uh, whether or not women can write, do art, all those things, which was, was kind of denied in the early part of the 60s. Uh, so you always have to look at the, the beginning point uh, for people when they started doing what they were doing. What were the conditions? And how have those conditions changed? So a big, big difference that has happened between then and now is that at the time I was starting to write about these things, there were no indigenous writers writing um, poetry, fiction, plays, making films, uh, doing a really uh, doing a lot of these uh, public artistic things. Uh, they just kind of why were they not there? Because some of them had been there in the 19th century, and then you just get this blank. So the exploration of that blank has been pretty informative, and a lot of that exploration is, is, has been done and is being done by the huge um, number that we now have of writers, poets, playwrights, filmmakers, um, nonfiction writers such as Thomas King, um, so that, that has all happened since the 80s. It's that recent. It's a big change. So if I were writing, for instance, Survival, which was my examination of this uh, issue back in 72, it would be quite different. It is interesting, uh, I think, the way in which Canada has evolved, certainly across my lifetime, from being this Scots-Irish Presbyterian outpost of uh, a kind of greater British world um, to a much more vibrant multicultural world, especially in terms of Indigenous peoples, also the very large South Asian population, especially in Toronto. Now, I remember somebody once said that you could tell when the Scots-Irish were losing their grip on Toronto when Italian restaurants cooking with garlic first appeared in the city. Do you remember that? Oh, yes, I remember that. Uh, not only that, I, I did not see an avocado. Uh, I didn't know there were such things as avocados until 1962, mm. and nor did I see one in Canada. I was in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the time. Uh, well, a lot of these things have, have, have changed a lot, but let me just put in a little thing. The, the Scots-Irish thing, that, that, that kind of domination, it was a much more diverse uh, landscape back in the 19th century. Mm. Okay, so what happened there? Um, and and you can you can you can examine that. Um, part of it has to do with banking, as you might might not surprise you. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> indeed. It so. turned out to be a much more interesting history than we had learned in high school, because yeah. when we were in high school, all of the interesting stuff, such as bad things that had been done, those were all under the carpet. Yeah. So the history was about wheat. Mm. So will that send you to sleep pretty quickly? Yes, it did. So we just grew up thinking that there, it wasn't interesting and we wanted to learn about, you know, Macbeth and, and yeah. uh, stuff like that. Um, but that was the line. And the reason it was the line was that the powers that be thought we shouldn't know about those things. Mm. Yes, I think, and <clears throat> the process of knowing things that we uh, weren't taught uh, is a continuing one and is certainly very resonant uh, in Canada today, in the United States, and of course in, in Britain itself. How far do you think, beyond giving you a sense of a certain version of Canadian identity, growing up in the place you did and being very close to nature, the environment, do you think how far has that informed uh, the kind of activism which you may or may not have expected to embrace or wanted to, your environmental activism more recently? Yes, well, about activists in general, let's, let's say that I'm not a real activist. A real activist does nothing but. That's their whole thing that they do. Um, the reason that i am become a voice for these things is that I don't have a job, and therefore I can't be fired. And a lot of writers and artists... Um, I think increasingly less because a lot of them now work in universities, which puts a different light on things for them. Um, so because I don't have a job, I can say things that would get other people into trouble. They get me into trouble to a certain extent, but not to the extent of getting fired because I don't have a job. So um, I did grow up with early environmentalists, and those would be my parents. And I've followed that story along through Rachel Carson and, mm. and the Club of Rome in 1972 
and on through the years when these concerns were um, not central to the stories that people were telling in the media. They, there would be nature programs and stuff like that. I can remember the first David Attenborough programs. They were very lovely. People watched them. But the sense of crisis, which biologists were already aware of years ago, that has not come to the center of the page until quite recently. And thank you, Greta Thunberg. Um, but we as a species have to deal with this if we want to continue being a species on this planet. You spent no going to Mars is not going to be the solution. Sorry. You spent a lot of time uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and perhaps on into the early 80s. Uh, of course, writing, and we'll we'll come to that in a moment. But you had a succession of, uh, as it seems, temporary jobs or jobs as writer in residence at universities. And you said at some point, uh, success for me meant no longer having to teach at university. Uh, I'm especially eager to encourage you to um, expand on that, not least because most fellows of the British Academy either have taught at university or do teach at university, which may perhaps explain why they're less active in public issues, at least some of them, than you are. But uh, that notion, perhaps, that leaving university, not having to earn your living that way, freed you up uh, from the sort of critical environment of universities to write uh, more in the way that you wanted to? Is, is that the sort of thing that, that you're getting at? Me. No, it's it's a question of time. So teaching is very, uh, if, you, if you really take it seriously, and I enjoyed teaching. Um, I enjoyed the students. I enjoyed the things I, I was teaching, which were uh, Victorian literature and American romanticism by and large, and then a little dabbling in creative writing, but it was really too early for that to have been um, a thing at universities. So I was teaching literature. I was teaching literature that I enjoyed, and I enjoyed teaching it. But then there's all of these other things that you have to do. So the other things are what kill you. I'm not good on committees. Just not good. Not part of my skill set. When I was the chair of the writers' union, we had the shortest meetings ever recorded. Can we move on? <laughs> That's very admirable. Yeah. I think I think chairing short meetings shows considerable skill, and you must give me some lessons in it. I would be grateful. Yes, well, it's not always the best way to do things. You know, one other way to do things is just to keep talking until everybody comes to a consensus. Um, so I taught. I, I went to two universities, namely University of Toronto, Victoria College, which seemed a pretty harmonious place. Uh, I went to graduate school at Harvard, where we didn't really have that much contact with, with the teaching staff in those days. Um, but that seemed to go along pretty well. And then my first um, teaching job was at the University of British Columbia, where the English department was at war with the other members. It had one of these feuds going uh, that nobody could quite remember the origins of, um, and since I was such I was so, so low on the totem pole, I didn't really get involved in it because I didn't have any power, so who would, who would want to recruit me? But, you know, half of, the, half of the people there weren't speaking to the other people. And you thought, what is going on? You know, this is supposed to be the humanities, it's supposed to make you uh, more tolerant of human nature, you're supposed to understand things about being a human being, and, and these people are just... Um, at daggers drawn. How can that be? So, you know, they're not always harmonious places. And um, that, can, that can use up a lot of your time. And I can also see going down the road, once you start publishing things, other people look at you with, with uh, they look at you out of the corners of, of their eyes. Or in those days, it, it was considered sort of not done to publish novels if you were a serious scholar. One of the themes that has <clears throat> come to great prominence during your life in which you've been involved has been the environment. I suppose it's fair to say that another one uh, would be feminism. And you've 
talked a lot and written a lot. Uh, many of your characters are strong women. But your relationship with feminism or your sense of its varieties and its differences uh, is, I think, a subject of considerable interest. And I wonder if you'll be willing to talk a bit about that. Okay, so 75 different kinds. Actually, I must go online and check up and see if it's increased. There's probably more kinds now. Uh, since it's, it's, it's like any big movement. So the big movement gets going, and then you start having schisms and disagreements and subsets and new insights and new uh, ways of looking at it and denunciations of other people. And if you would like to see a history of that, you go to Phyllis Chesler, who has written a history of United States feminism in the early days. That would be around uh, 68, 69, in the 60s, going public around 68, 69, and into the 70s. And there were a lot of wars going on amongst different factions and, and different individuals. Um, but I, being from a backwater, and indeed I was in Edmonton, Alberta, when, when the uh, women's movement second phase went public, and, and there was no feminism there mm -hmm. then in 1969. Uh, so, so I've watched it evolve. It's been, it's been very interesting, and you could make a broad banner over the top of it and say women are human beings. Uh, you could say um, human rights are women's rights too. And, and under that banner, I'm, I'm quite happy to march. Uh, but when, when it comes to some of the schisms and wars, um, I think maybe not. So the kind that interests me uh, right now is the equality now kind, which concentrates on um, getting laws changed in many countries that have to do with, with equal human rights for girls and women. And that ties in with my environmental interest, too, because we know that educating women produces better results uh, in regards to the environment. So giving women the tools that they need. They're, they're half the human race. And if the human race wants to survive as a species, it's got to solve the climate crisis. And women are probably half or more than half of that solution since they buy a lot of stuff. One of uh, the books, uh, one of the many books for which you're most famous is The Handmaid's Tale. And part of the uh, themes of that book are the treatment and oppression of women and minorities. Uh, how, what is, it, what is your sense of the difference between being um, a, an activist campaigner and writing about these issues in works of fiction? How, how does all that play out for you? Well, works of fiction are explorations and, and uh, um, speculative fiction, dystopian, utopian, they're, they're what-if books. So what if reality were a little bit different from the way it is? How would that play out? And uh, as I've always been pretty interested in the United States, indeed I have ancestral roots in it, uh, since my ancestors got kicked out of just about everywhere for being of the contrarian view, they also were early Puritans, and then they were early United Empire loyalists when it came to the revolution. So they, uh, they, they were kind of against everything. And um, no, no, no surprise there. Some of them are Huguenot, French Huguenot, who got kicked out of France in the 18th century. Um, now the question was, what's the difference? So, so, so books explore what if, and the what if question for The Handmaid's Tale was, what if the United States were to have a totalitarianism? As having been born in 1939, I am, of course, very interested in totalitarianisms, how they get going, and what they do. And one thing they always do is try to control women and their reproduction, mm -hmm. uh, who gets to have sex, etc., all those things, who gets to marry whom, uh, how women should behave. So they do that a lot. And my answer to that question was, it wouldn't be, hi, my name is Joe, I'm a communist, let's all be communists. That's unlikely to happen in the United States. Uh, but, hi, I've got the true religion, and uh, we're going to set up God's kingdom on earth, 17th century. Um, that's much more likely. And you just saw an example of it, uh, of the storming of the capital. I hope you noted those crosses. 
it's interesting, isn't it, that that book, The Handmaid's Tale, resonated, I think, politically when it came out in the 1980s yes. and has then, as it were, re-resonated um, in more recent times. Yeah, it wasn't uh, universally acclaimed when it first appeared because some people said, oh, no, that would never happen. That would never happen here, Margaret. You're just, you know, blowing smoke. And, um, and other people said, yes, it would. So the further you got towards the West Coast, the more likely they were to say, yes, it would. Uh, and in, in England, it was it was initially treated as good yarn, because England had had its Oliver Cromwell period, and uh, whatever else they might do, it's unlikely to be that. Uh, it might be some other kind of totalitarianism, but not that particular uh, 17th century Puritan uh, so-called Christian fundamentalist uh, line. So it, it, is be, it became more, more pertinent in the two Obama elections when you had the wise Republicans saying some very peculiar things about, about women. Uh, and then it really um, shot up during the, the Trump election and in the, and, in the, and in the aftermath of it. And the television show launched in April 2017. And nobody was any longer saying this couldn't happen. One of the points that you've made about a lot of your writing um, is that there's a difference between science fiction, which you don't write, and speculative fiction, which you do. And as I understand it, your claim about speculative fiction is that everything you write about either has happened or is being worked on or might happen or could happen. Could you talk a bit about what you see as the differences there? Okay, let's go way back into the 19th century, and we'll put a big banner up, and it says Wonder Tales. And under Wonder Tales, you've got everything that isn't realism, naturalism, Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice. Um, and, and you might have, for instance, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, one of the first real science fiction uh, books. And you might have uh, some of Bulwer-Lytton's weirder tales, and you might have uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, and you might have Ryder Haggard, and you might uh, have Jules Verne. So Jules Verne is the originator of, yes, it could happen, speculative fiction. He wrote about things he thought were really on the drawing board, such as submarines and air travel. And then along comes H.G. Wells. And he writes The Time Traveler, and he writes War of the World. And Jules Verne throws up his hands and said, Mais il en vont, but, but he's making stuff up. Uh, so that's the difference. Jules Verne thought, OK, this could really happen. I know people are working on it, submarines, um, air travel, etc. cetera. Um, and H.G. Wells went to other planets and brought us time travel Martians and, and spaceships. Um, if, you, if you count the Martians flying tin can as a spaceship, which I do. Um, so, so that's the big divergence, and, and that really took off. And that gave you the golden age in the 30s of um, weird tales and, and um, a lot of a lot of invention in that area, but I grew up in the 50s, or I was a teenager then. So when I was supposed to be doing my homework, I was reading Ray Bradbury, um, Orson, sorry, uh, George Orwell, and Aldous Huxley, uh, and a number of other writers who were writing those kinds of stories. And it's partly just a matter of skill set. So I can't do spaceships. Cannot do. I can't do dragons. Anyway, there are really good dragons out there. Would I ever want to compete with Ursula K. Le Guin's dragons? No. Um, I like reading those kinds of books. I'm a big um, Lord of the Rings fan, but, but I can't do those things. Um, but you, you do do dystopias. Um, that's different. Indeed. So, <laughs> a dystopia is is the society you don't want to live in. <clears throat> utopia is, here's a better idea. And every dystopia has got a little utopia embedded in it. In other words, here is why we think this one is bad, because this other one is, 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 sounds nicer to us. 
Uh, and a utopia always has got a little dystopia in it, which in the 19th century, which produced utopias like, you know, macaroni. Um, it was always the present day. You know, we have all this poverty, we've got this pollution, we've got this, you know, black smoke everywhere. But in the future, which I, the author, will take you to, usually via some really peculiar device, such as falling over a tree root, um, in the future, things are much nicer, and here's what they look like there. So I wasn't any good at utopias either. It was it was it became very difficult to write them after World War One and then World War Two, and the um, totalitarianism such as um, Hitler, Mussolini, um, Stalin, and Mao that all came in as utopias. You know, we're going to make things so much better, but first we have to kill those people. And it always did involve killing a lot of those people. Um, so it began, became very difficult to write utopias, but quite easy to write dystopias because we had seen what they looked like. Final question for me before we uh, open up, since um, I'm told here on the chat that lots of questions are coming through and I'm eager to give chance to for you to engage with those. But if we take, as it were, the current world, which is somewhere between dystopia and utopia, I suppose, at the best or the worst, um, two of the features of it are, of course, the extraordinary rise of um, adversarial social media and the world of COVID. And, of course, there's a serious interconnection between them. What role do you see or, well, what are your thoughts about those things? And what role do you see for, for writers, for the, the arts, the humanities, the social sciences in this rather strange world in which we find ourselves now? Okay, it is a strange world. And, and if, you, if you scroll back in time, um, every time there's been a new invention uh, for the production and distribution of information. And yes, I went to school right up the road from Marshall McLuhan when he was writing the Gutenberg Galaxy. Um, so every time there has been the arrival of one of these things, such as the printing press, um, you get a lot of social upheaval um, because not only can you print world classics and religious texts on a printing press, you can print a lot of political pamphlets and pornography and that's what happened. Um, so then along comes radio in the 30s and it's one of my views that um, Hitler would not have been nearly as successful were it not for radio. Because here was this new thing, and it was like the voice of God coming right into your ears. And the advent of social media and the internet has been very similar. Um, television had a similar effect when it arrived as well. Um, the Kennedy election was, um, says McLuhan, pretty much due to the fact that that Kennedy was good on television and Nixon was not. Mm. <laughs> yes, five o'clock shadow. Uh, he looked pretty sinister. Um, yeah, so, so along comes the internet and social media and it's, and it's the same effect. All of a sudden all of this information of all kinds is flying around and, and people don't know how to tell uh, the difference. You know, what is true and what is not true. And this is the problem that we have right now. And if you've been studying the, the QAnon story, a, a lot of people and families have already been destroyed by it because people have got sucked right into the rabbit hole. They really believe this stuff. And, um, and what is your role as members of the academy? Okay, tell the truth. <laughs> Sometimes it seems as if it's not doing any good because who is listening, but um, I think tell the truth is really, unless you, unless you do that, you're not going to be anywhere. Um, but a lot of the disinformation is being de has been deliberate, and the result of it is, is frequently not that people change from one belief to another one, it's that they cease to believe anything because you don't know what to believe. And going back in time also, I have to say at this juncture that the Academy has not always had clean hands in this respect. So who really provided the, um, the theory of witchcraft? You know, before there was a theory of witchcraft, um, it was a folk belief. So you get a theory and you get uh, high authorities pushing it and then you get the the witch burnings. 
Um, so, so the academy uh, was also a big pusher of race theory in the 19th century. You know, that academy of people who know, you know, people who want to know, we're saying this, it must be true. Uh, so, so further investigation of just about everything and doing due diligence. Is this true? That's your job. Is it true? And it's no. a pretty good job these days because we <laughs> just look at what's out there. We could um, talk much more, I'm sure, but um, uh, there are lots indeed of questions piling up. <clears throat> so I'm, as it were, the um, the medium here, um, but not the message. Uh, back to Marshall McLuhan. Uh, but let me uh, uh, ventriloquize a few texts uh, to put it in another um, uh, idiom. Uh, so here is one question which I, I, I'm sure will interest many fellows of the Academy as well as a broader audience, because um, uh, we like to think that we write a lot. So here is the question. What is your writing process? Has it changed over the years? And if so, what is your most recent process? And in parentheses, I have, we have several questions about writing. So tell us how, do you, do you have a certain number of hours a day when you always try to write? Do you wake up with lots of phrases and ideas clamoring for attention? Do you write in longhand on the screen? How does, how does that process, that business work for you? And has it changed in the course of your life? Everybody's different. And uh, nothing that one writer says should be taken as a set of rules for any other writer. Um, I personally um, write poems in longhand, which can lead to problems because my handwriting is very bad. So I come back to my handwritten manuscripts and, what's this word? <laughs> what did I? What did I? What, what, what was I intending to, to say? So I sometimes have to figure that out. Uh, with the novels and stories, I usually start them off in longhand because uh, I'm one of these people who learned cursive. And because I made a bad decision in, in high school, um, I won't say it's a bad decision, um, a decision that was not yet informed by my later knowledge that I would become a writer. So instead of taking typing as I ought to have done, I took home economics. So if you want your zipper set in, I'm your gal, but I can't touch type. So it means that I have to look at the keyboard. I can go quite quickly, but I do use only four fingers. Um, so I was very happy when the personal computer came along because it means that I can uh, correct my own TypeScript. Before I would have this really quite bad TypeScript, I would use the little a white brush, mm. I would use the little stick-on pieces of white tape, I would put notes in the margin, I would send it to my typist who actually could read all this stuff, and she would produce um, a more perfect manuscript. Um, so I usually start with longhand, about 30 pages in, I start typing at the beginning while I continue to write uh, at the other end. And I can, if I'm going pretty quickly, I can I can switch to completely typing. Um, but it but I think it's it, it's how you learn. So it's it's the it's the hand eye brain coordination, whichever way you've learned to do that, which gives you the most flow. Because you, what you don't want is your method of writing, your physical method of writing, interrupting what is actually coming out. Well, I'm reassured that you can't touch type. I can't either. I think I can just about manage four fingers as well. And <clears throat> like you, was hugely cheered and encouraged when the word processor came into being. But do you write every day? Do you have a certain number of hours a day when oh, you write? I wish I did. Yes, I would like very much to be more organized than I am, but it's too late now. So I did once try to write uh, a novel in an organized way, and it was a complete disaster. So the only, the only way that I can do, the only thing that seems to work for me, once I get going, then I do put in a certain number of hours, but it's not hours for me, it's pages. Mm. So it depends how quickly you write your four pages a day or two pages or whatever it is. Um, so then I'm, I'm also, and some people are completely the opposite. They have to get the first page absolutely perfect before they can go on to the next. I'm mm. not like that at all. Um, I'm, I'm a person who in home economics did not care what the inside of the garment looked like. 
I was not big on seam finishing. I just wanted the <laughs> I wanted the effect. So I get through the draft, uh, and then I start revising, and that can be six to eight revisions. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the words that. Um those of us like me who can't write fiction, I've never been able to write dialogue, uh, think about with regard to uh, creative writers, as it were, is this word inspiration. I don't know whether that, as it were, rings any bells with you. We've talked about, for instance, uh, what might be the inspiration that the growing up where you did has had on you. What about influence or inspiration from, from other novelists or poets? Are there any particular, as it were, other creative writers and authors who you feel have particularly uh, influenced or inspired your own work? Okay. So I always say Shakespeare because it's safe. <laughs> if you say anybody else, the others will all get mad at you, even if they're dead. So it's quite risky. Uh, if you name a living person, all of the other living ones are going to be quite furious because it wasn't them. Um, so you're, you're pretty safe with Shakespeare. And the other good thing about him is that nobody knows much about him. Mm. So he's kind of a, he's a bit of a blank slate, but he was a great inventor of words. And uh, um, yeah, and he also, he didn't know he was Shakespeare. He just thought he was this guy uh, who was producing plays and, and, and you, had to, you had to make quite a few of them in order to, you know, keep it turning over. Mm. Um, but he is, as an historian, of course you know, uh, that he gave English people the first view of their own history. That's why he made his he made most of his money on his history plays, mm. um, because because that was where you could go and see what just happened. <laughs> you know what what was that that my that happened to my grandfather or my great grandfather? What was going on? And uh, this is another thing that's true of of time and history and events. You you kind of don't know what happened if you're in the middle of it. Um, don't know whether you've read a novel called *The Red Badge of Courage*, um, and it's about you know being in the Civil War, and it basically, you have no idea what's going on because it's so noisy and filled with smoke. And similarly, pe people are going to be picking over that um, storming of the Capitol for for years, <laughs> because even if you were there, you don't you can't quite grasp what was going on. You, what's happening? That's why we have so many histories of, of wars, because people who are actually in the war can only see their part of it. Mm -hmm. They don't know, they don't have the overview, they don't have the big picture, they don't have those little maps with the arrows on them that are so useful to the rest of us afterwards. What I'm reading right now is this astonishing book, I'll give it a little plug, The World Turned Upside Down, and it is the most complete history of the Cultural Revolution in China that you will probably ever have. Well, this guy was born in 1940, so he lived through these events. He was a reporter. I don't know why he's still alive. Um, and he has done a huge amount of digging into documents. Because an interesting thing about totalitarianisms is they do keep a lot of records. <laughs> You know, sometimes it's burn them, burn them really quickly, but they don't get to burning them, and then it's too late. Um, so he's been digging around amongst the documents, and, and it is fascinating. Number one, it was much more horrible than you think. Um, but number two, it was much more planned than, than you might have thought at the time. And it was a, it was a power grab by, by Mao. One of the other ways in which the people like me who don't write fiction think about uh, or uh, maybe wrongly, but not entirely think about uh, inspiration for those who do write fictional poetry is not just as it, as it were other writers who may have influenced you, but the way in which you can put your own self into your writing. And I've got a question here, uh, which relates to that. Uh, what character do you relate to the most in either A Handmaid's Tale or The Testaments? What character did you pour the most of yourself into? can't be answered. Um, so people say that there's two kinds of writers, Shakespearean writers and Miltonian writers. So with Milton, it's always Milton. You know, there isn't, there isn't anybody else on the page, really. Um, with Shakespeare, you've got no idea. You cannot say uh, which of those characters is the most like Shakespeare, although I always put in a bit of a bid for, for Prospero 
um, in The Tempest because that's the only portrait of a director, producer, writer we've we've got from him. Um, except for the you know Midsummer Night's Dream, the the rustics performance. Um, I I don't I don't think of my um, ego in that way. So of course everything that you write has gone through your head in some way. It's it's been um, in your brain and it's come out in the form of words. So, but then the question is inspiration, breathing in. How does that stuff get into your head in the first place? And it can be through reading other writers. It can be through reading the newspaper. It can be a conversation with a, a friend. Um, it can be just your observation of how things go and hearing people's stories. So so there isn't there isn't a character who is quotes um, me in in that way. Um, I've put a lot of you know stuff that I've observed in my life. Of course, who who hasn't? So if you go to Cat's Eye, uh, that's the kind of school there was then, and those are the kinds of things you did in the playground at recess. Um, so then then I get people writing to me saying, I remember all of that, uh, but but that's about them. Mm. <laughs> so I I think that the other thing is, are are you? interested in analyzing your psyche or are you interested in looking at the world um, it can of course be both and it always is both so I think of Dickens as somebody who really looked at the world but a lot of the darker moments mm. in his writing came from his life particularly that childhood in the blacking factory which made a huge impression on him um, so it's very hard to separate those things but but it's it's impossible to write only about yourself and nothing else because you you exist someplace you're in a place you're in a physical place you you have presumably a mother and a father we we think mm. uh, how much how how important has that been to you what about your siblings if any what about your uh, childhood you you can't just write about you in isolation from other people but similarly, if you're writing about other people, say you're a playwright, some of you is going in there, but, but in a way, it's not my job to unpick those threads. I'm not doing a thesis on myself. I have a, 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 a slightly different question here. Um, uh, can you comment on the fact that in Britain, students can get through their whole A-level in English literature without studying a novel, a play, or a poem by a woman? What implications do you think this has for education? I think that's dumb. Um, so what are you going to do about Jane Austen and George Eliot mm. and the Brontes? Um, so what are they studying? Pray tell. Yep. Well, perhaps they'll get back to us on that. Um, uh, I have another question here, um, which, in fact, you've already touched on, but perhaps you might be tempted to uh, dilate a little more. How do you feel the development of the world influenced your writing of the Testaments compared to The Handmaid's Tale? Okay, so that's a good one. Uh, um, Handmaid's Tale, I start writing in the early 80s after Ronald Reagan has just been elected. Mm. And the religious right is rising, and they're saying stuff like women belong in the home. And I'm saying stuff like, well, if, if that is so, how are you going to get them back in there? <laughs> Since they're running around all over the place like ants, how are you going to cram them back into the home? Well, you just dial back uh, to about the middle of the 19th century and derive, deprive them of you know, voting rights, money, ability to own things, jobs, all of that stuff that has come along since. Uh, so that was um, part of the thinking there. Handmaid's Tale comes out, the Cold War is still going on. Okay, 89, Cold War ends, and all the pieces on the chest uh, set start to move around, because they always do when a, when a big change like that happens. Um, then we have the 90s in which it was sort of end of history, remember that? Mm -hmm. 
You didn't believe it either. No. 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 I'd have been out of a job. <laughs> exactly. Well, um, it didn't end because then along comes 9-11 and everything moves around again. And, and then comes the 2008 meltdown, the economic meltdown. And when you have the Twin Towers being blown up and the meltdown, people start getting anxious and afraid. And when people start getting anxious and afraid and, and angry, uh, you're setting the stage for whose fault is it. You're setting the stage for who's going to be the scapegoat here. And you're setting the stage for Donald Trump to tell you why your anger is justified and it's the fault of those people. Um, so on the one hand, that kind of rhetoric, and and then beneath it, the QAnon stuff. It's the, it's the fault of whatever's going on under some pizza parlor that doesn't have a cellar. Um, so, so then we segue towards the 2016 um, election, which was in November. So in August and September, we're already filming The Handmaid's Tale, and I am in fact in a cameo. Um, in which um, Ann Dowd is playing Aunt Lydia. So then I start writing, or at the same time, but interconnected, I start writing about Aunt Lydia, uh, who I think is a pretty interesting character. What, why do people become collaborationists? <laughs> There's a lot of theories about that. And you can read uh, much in history about people who did become collaborationists and why they did. So her story and her rise to power within that uh, structure and within a totalitarianism, the opposition is always from within because there isn't any without. There is no separate opposition that can, that can um, that is visible, so that it's always a power manipulations from inside the, the structure itself. So I thought that would be pretty interesting to explore. Your latest work, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask a question now, if that's all right, because we are, we are rapidly, I fear, running to a close. And I think most of the questions that have come in, you've, um, you've very deftly dealt with. So perhaps I could return to a couple of questions by way of conclusion. Your latest work, Dearly, is a wonderful collection of poetry and your first in a decade. Can you explain, as it were, how you've returned to poetry after quite a long time away from it and how writing poetry differs from other sorts of writing beyond the fact that, as you said earlier, you always write poetry in longhand? Yeah, um, I, n I never, um, I didn't return because I never left. So typically, I just I, I write poetry and I and I put it in a drawer, and um, after a while, I I get it out and look at it, and um, as I've said, <laughs> try to decipher what it says, and then when there's enough, I lay it all out on the floor, a time honored method, and um, I'm not alone in doing this, and and arrange it. So that is the same as, as what happened with Dearly, but if, if you look at um, the collection before that that was called The Door, it was about 10 years after the one before it. So I was writing more poetry compared to prose in the 60s um, because I had jobs. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to write a novel. Um, or it takes a lot longer to write a novel. I, I was writing them, but it took longer if you have a day job. And I had day jobs of one kind or another throughout that, that period and, and did not cease having them till 1972. Um, and you'll notice then that the, um, the novels and short story collections become more frequent because I had the time to do them. This may seem a very impertinent question, but can I ask you what you're writing at the moment when you're not having to take time away to do uh, wonderful interviews like this? <laughs> yes, I have uh, several different things uh, on the burner, as we say, and one of them is a collection of essays over the past uh, almost 20 years. So there are two previous collections and this will be the third and we're putting that together right now and it will come out a year from now. And it will be called Burning Questions. 
Um, so there's there's that one. I'm writing some some short stories, and we're looking at putting together a, a selected stories as well. And uh, then I'm I'm going to take a crack at writing a a literary memoir. Uh, so those are those are the things, and we won't even mention the musical comedy based on on um, Angel Catbird, the the flying combination of um, bird, cat, and human being, which is at its core a bird conservation project. <laughs> we actually have a lot of things. Well, here's um, uh, a question which slightly relates to that, but has just come in. Did your writing procedure or reading habit styles change during this pandemic? I started reading your books exactly because I felt COVID really was very dystopian. Do you feel this will influence your future books? Oh, this pandemic. You know, the people who are going to write the books about this are probably teenagers right now because those are the people upon this is upon whom this has had I would say the biggest impact uh, it's really disrupted their social life their school life you know everything that they thought they were going to do they're suddenly not doing um, or over the past year they haven't been so it's it's going to have been a formative experience for them so for me not so much I had already written a but with a big plague in it, that would be Oryx and Crake. Uh, and in my childhood, there were there were a lot of communicable diseases that caused people to be put in, in quarantine because we didn't yet have vaccines for things like, like polio. Uh, we did have one for diphtheria, but it wasn't very wide, widely deployed. And I had four cousins who died of it. So... Um, these, the idea that there, there are these diseases and that you have to stay in your house and have a sign put on your door and have food delivered, I grew up with that. Mm. I saw it. And um, I don't think we had polio until the mid-50s. And before that time, you were just told not to go to a public swimming pool in the summer, mm. uh, avoid crowds, you know, all of those kinds of things. Uh, we now know how it spread. It wasn't spread through the air, but... Uh, you could get it out of swimming pool, and and many did. So, so there, so there you have it. So to me, no, but young people, yes, they're they're going to be writing these books. I have an absolutely final question. Since we have a couple of minutes left, you've produced an extraordinary lifetime's oeuvre, uh, both in quantity and in exceptional quality, across an amazing range of genres, um, and you have very properly been laden with prizes and forms of recognition and honour, and we are glad to add our own to that exceptionally long and very distinguished list. You have nothing left to prove to anybody, so why do you keep writing now? Well, why did I write in the first place? It wasn't to prove anything to anybody. Uh, it was because I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, you know, it's like, why does the sun shine? Well, it's there. Um, it's because I'm a writer, and we'll just uh, move to to the question of uh, what are the arts for? You know, people have been asking that ever since the Greeks. Uh, I would say the the arts aren't quotes for a specific thing. They're a foundational part of being a human being, and uh, every everybody has got some of that uh, human creative ability, which may manifest itself in um, knitting or carpentry or you know weekend painting or something like that because we all kind of do it people do it and uh, people who are who are thought of as as artists are just people who do it publicly but it's the same thing that they're doing well, that's um, good news for the rest of us who don't do the sort of wonderful things you do but perhaps do some of the other things that you've just mentioned. Um, I fear this terrible phrase that one has to produce at this point in the proceedings as fascinating and memorable as this, we are, alas, out of time. Uh, but I want to um, thank uh, the uh, hundreds of people who have uh, Zoomed in from around the world uh, for this event. I want to thank the technical people at the British Academy 
for having made it work. Uh, I want to thank those of you who have sent in questions. But of course, and above all else, uh, Margaret, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to offer renewed congratulations on the award of the President's Medal, which was pleasurable when it happened, and it is even more pleasurable uh, in the light of this conversation. Uh, I want to express on behalf of many people our abiding admiration uh, for your extraordinary uh, lifetime's work, happily uh, not yet over. Uh, and I want to say how much so many of us admire the work that you do, um, the life that you live, uh, and the person that you are. Um, and you have displayed all these admirable qualities very brilliantly in this last hour, and we are enormously in your debt for that. Um, and I truly wish we could have gone on for longer. But thank you so very, very much. We are very grateful and very appreciative. And thank you. And lovely to see you all, even though I can't see you. <laughs> <laughs>